Well, thank you all for coming out. Um, you know, I've always wondered what it had been like to see Charlie Parker and John Coltrane improvising, getting up on stage without any real idea of what they're going to play, and it ends up being something wonderful. Um, I'd like to think that tonight is going to be one of those nights. <laughs> um, <laughs> Where are you going with this, Keith? I don't know. <laughs> right, because we are improvi improvising here. Neil and Crawford who is the son of Ralston Crawford and has been um, central to allowing us to put together the, the collection we have of Ralston's work, is uh, not here yet. Uh, he was in Denver, spent 24 hours in Denver because of the weather, and I hope that he's going to walk in at some point while folks are still here, but he's not here yet. So um, in the spirit of... Um, creative improvisation, Jonathan Spees from Menconi and Shulkoff mm -hmm. Gallery in New York, which has represented the Crawford Estate, uh, primarily paintings and prints, but represented the Crawford Estate for years. How many? Well, uh, full, full disclosure, I've known Neilan for over, so almost 15 years now. Okay. Um, I started working with him, which, you know, um, is, is nothing, but... Um, I started working with Neilan when he was uh, working with uh, Zabriskie Gallery in mm -hmm. the 2000s, um, and we had a rare opportunity at that moment to show photographs and paintings and prints and drawings all together. Now, since then, uh, I've been at uh, another gallery working mainly with paintings, um, just because that's kind of our, our client base. So. I'm a big lover of everything that you're doing to integrate, you know, Keith's book integrates the, the paintings with the prints, with the drawings as a unified sort of vision. And that's something that I've, I've really admired for a long time. So uh, that, was, that was how I met Neilan was uh, admiring the, the continuity of all mm -hmm. these things across, um, across media. So anyway. So I hadn't met Jonathan until six and a half minutes ago, but I'm so persuasive um, <laughs> that he agreed to um, uh, volunteer to uh, fill, as well as e either one of us can, to fill Neilan's shoes for at least a while here. But I thought it would be very interesting um, to have an expert in Crawford, but from the painting angle. Um, uh, you know, both of us really loved the fact that Crawford worked across um, uh, a variety of mediums and did so incredibly well. For my taste, uh, no 20th century American artist was better at that. But at any rate, I've got, um, I had laid this, uh, I laid out some visuals here so that Neil and I would have, well, so we'd do two things. That visually we could present to you all a representative sample of what Ralston Crawford did from early to late in various mediums. Um, there's about a dozen sort of uh, units here uh, to introduce him, introduce the work, talk about the work. But hopefully each one of those little sections will allow for brief conversation about uh, various interesting uh, aspects or tangents in the work. Uh, so Crawford, we have a, a Oh, and that's probably him. Let's just it, Skype him in. It is. H hang on just a minute. <laughs> Neilan, Keith here. <laughs> just landed. Okay. Um, Put him on speaker. Okay, yeah. We're, we're, we can fill you in, but uh, we've got a nice audience here. <laughs> we'll, we'll see you soon. Well, she, she, she's in here now. Just ask for the auditorium. Yep, thanks. He's on the way. This close. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, Crawford was born in 1906 um, up near Buffalo, New York. We have a portrait of him in his 20s, late 20s, early 30s, and then another portrait from probably the 1960s. And he, the, the context of his growing up in Buffalo is, is very important to who he was and what his, his art ideas were about. 
His father and his uncle were both captains of um, cargo vessels on the Great Lakes. They were ship captains on the Great Lakes. So Crawford grew up in this environment of um, ships and docks and heavy machinery and uh, grain elevators. This, this um, wonderful, exciting, uh, high-tech uh, world of um, shipping and transport and uh, locks and machinery. And this uh, environment, you know, very clearly played a very important role in, in shaping at least his early ideas um, about what art was, what, what art could do. Then, before he studied art uh, officially or formally, he uh, took a, a job for about half a year or so on a fruit freighter for the United Fruit Company uh, cargo vessel going from the East Coast down to Central America and back to transport bananas and, and all kinds of other uh, fruits. Um, so he did live the life of a seagoing, um, you know, uh, worker on a, on a commercial vessel. Um, so he had first-hand experience uh, himself as a young man with both the mechanics of ships, uh, the machinery involved, and the great expanse, the infinite expanse of uh, the ocean. And these subjects, um, not surprisingly, uh, form an important part of at least his early work, but his interest in the sea, ships, and shipping, um, nautical culture uh, lasted uh, throughout his life. And I just have a couple visuals here. Jonathan, do you have any? Uh... Well, I, I wanted to add that, that not only does he uh, uh, put a lot of time and energy throughout his life in uh, nautical themes and uh, scenes of maritime industry, but there's also this sort of inveterate traveler aspect mm -hmm. to his life that, I mean, he is painting in the South Pacific, he's painting in uh, uh, Scotland, he goes to Egypt later in life, he is all over the map. Um, one of the things that most defines his uh, I think his eye is that uh, that sort of wandering perspective of looking for uh, new subject matter and then making you sort of travel a certain distance to d decode it. And that has, it seems almost baked into the notion of, mm. of just being, you know, uh, just a, a traveling perspective. So even in, in mm. something simple like this, the, the, the red uh, masts, which are almost fully abstracted into these arrow-like forms, starts to challenge you into a sense of what, uh, what painting will be for, for Ralston um, as, it, as it departs from, here's a painting of a boat. You know, now it starts to become something a little bit more abstracted, but uh, he'll obviously play with that mm -hmm. more as life goes on. So, which leads quite nicely into his training as an artist. Um, he did have a very um, high-level um, academic uh, training, studied for uh, a year in, at the Otis School in Los Angeles, but then came back east and was uh, deeply influenced by the Barnes Collection, uh, which, of course, at that time was just outside Philadelphia. Uh, the Barnes Collection um, was, and I guess remains historically, you know, the, the single greatest uh, private collection of um, avant-garde European paintings, that is from the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, you know, here we're seeing Matisse, we're seeing, uh, um, that looks like a Chagall. He was so. especially interested in Cezanne. So these are two Cezannes from the Barnes collection. And of course, one of the things that Cezanne is all about is looking at the world um, for what it is, but looking through surfaces to some kind of underlying ge geometric logic. The idea of cubes, planes, uh, spheres, and so forth. And that notion of the underlying geometric logic of the world um, was certainly one of the great lessons that, that Crawford took from Cezanne in particular. And uh, Crawford is working in a very particular American context. The, the art scene around Philadelphia was very lively with some incredible talents. Charles DeMuth on the left, uh, that's my Egypt from the late 20s. 
That's a Charles Sheeler, who's also a Philadelphia resident from the early 1930s, the Ford factory at River Rouge. Um, you know, in both cases, we have an application of, of European notions of cubism, maybe some futurism too, but, but you know, the classic European isms that, that deal with um, ge geometric form in one way or another applied to the American vernacular and or industrial landscape. And that, that made a very um, identifiable and special kind of, of American avant-garde art. And you know, we use the word precisionist to describe a lot of this. And it's not, I mean, for Sheeler in particular, I think that's completely accurate. And just as an aside, um, Sheeler, as we know, worked in both photographs and paintings in a very conscious and deliberate way. Um, Sheeler's use of photographs, I would argue, differs pretty significantly from Crawford's in that Sheeler really did render the, his subject in a very meticulous and, and um, um, mimetic sort of form in painting, whereas Crawford manipulated spaces and relationships to a much larger degree. But again, this dynamic of an important American avant-garde artist working in both mediums, I think, is, is pretty interesting. I think you're, you're trying to avoid using a word like photorealism in, the, in, what, mm -hmm. in what Sheeler does, because there's something where he's, he's transferring the concept as closely, and you know, in, he's taking shiny metal, and he's producing a picture of shiny metal, mm -hmm. and, there, and that is something that Crawford flirts with, but does differently, as I think we'll see. Yeah. And then the, the, other, uh, the other side of that coin, so to speak, is the artistic community in which Crawford lived and worked. He had many art friends. He was very close with Niall Spencer, for example, and that's a Spencer on the left. And he was also buddies with uh, Stuart Davis. Um, he and, I mean, we, Neilan has told me, and, and it's in print, that um, the, the Crawfords and Stuart Davis and his wife would get together to listen to jazz records. And that, that notion is really interesting given what we know Stuart Davis did, his interest in jazz, and what Crawford would be doing very quickly after that. But you can see in both of these, um, the translation of, to some degree, a, a European artistic avant-garde vocabulary to an explicitly American subject. So Crawford's work then of the 30s and 40s um, again, picks up on themes that we've talked about, his love of ships, shipping, water, nautical culture in general, um, American vernacular structures. This is very Sheeler-esque. Uh, the Maitland painting from uh, 1938, I think. Um, concrete forms of a brand new highway structure, or bridge structure. We'll come back to this. Um, a factory structure, again, the, the, he's dealing with the, the same sort of conceptual world that Sheeler is, but the paintings are different. Mm -hmm. um, I see more hints of surrealism, frankly, in, in Crawford's early paintings than, than I think we ever get with Sheeler. And definitely, and there's, uh, well, with Niall, Niall Spencer, there's sometimes a, a more of a departure from the precision mm -hmm. aspect of precisionism, which we'll see increasingly mm -hmm. in Crawford, but. Uh, but he's willing to depart from those super crisp lines in his painting, which uh, grows, uh, mm -hmm. grows to be more meaningful over time. Uh, this painting is a, a terrific piece by Crawford uh, from 1938, and this is at the um, uh, Crystal Bridges Museum down in Bentonville. Um, it's got people in it. Sorry, it, I didn't want to it, steal your punchline, but it, it's got people in it. It does have people in it. <laughs> And I, I hadn't seen this until um, I went down there for the first time a year or two ago. And um, it was really interesting because since then I've seen a, 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 a moderate number of, of really good Crawford paintings. And they're all about, they're typically 30, 40, mm -hmm. this kind of size, which um, tells me something, that he wanted to paint on a scale where he could see the whole thing at once. He's not working on an 8 by 10 foot canvas. Never, yeah. Um, that these aren't small paintings by any stretch of the imagination, but they're, they're human-sized paintings. They're, they're explicitly easel-scale paintings. Mm -hmm. Would, 
Absolutely, and, and it's it somehow connects back to that uh, that foundation at the at the Barnes collection, where you know Cezanne, uh, Matisse, Renoir, all these all these painters are coming from an easel easel tradition. Yep. So yep. as opposed to where American painting is kind of going by 1950, yep. it's everybody wants to do you know the mural sized whatever it is. So yep. yeah. And so the, the classic sort of paintings that Crawford was doing in the late 30s, early 40s are images like this that deal in a very celebratory way with um, contemporary engineering subjects. Bridges, this is a print of his famous painting, Overseas Highway, done in 1939. Um, that painting was reproduced as a half-page illustration in Life magazine in early 1939 and became very famous. And for better or for worse, it became the one thing that Crawford was known for. And uh, as Neelan would say, Crawford spent quite a bit of time and energy trying to get out from under the burden of doing nothing but more overseas highways. But something about the plunging perspective, the, the clean geometry, the way this um, you know, is a very simple geometric sort of structure and yet, visual structure, and yet it does suggest this zooming movement out into space, back into space. And so audiences at the time connected with that. Again, the late 1930s is, is the high age of streamlining of, uh, you know, the 1939 World's Fair, the Trilon and... and Paris Fair. Paris Fair, yeah, yeah. yes. Um, and all, that's all part of a piece, I think, here. Uh, early 40s, the, uh, Crawford um, uh, volunteered when World War II came along. He, he thought he was going to be drafted anyway, so he volunteered. And he ended up serving in the Air Corps service, um, dealing with two things. Um, um, dealing with weather maps, making a kind of modernist new version of, of weather maps for pilots. And because of that work, he, he got deeply engaged in <clears throat> aviation stuff. He went to factories <coughs> to see new airplanes being created. Uh, and, oops, sorry. Um, and he went to crash sites as well. And we'll get to that in a minute. And he also, um, you know, briefly in 1943, 4, 5, did a number of Fortune magazine covers and stories as well. These are two of his Fortune magazine covers that I think are pretty interesting. The one on the left is a, for stories on a, um, a civilian aviation. The one on the right is for a, a multiple stories on the new science or the new technology of radar. So his early photographs then, <clears throat> he begins in about 1938 making photographs, and it's my thesis that from the beginning he thought about the medium in a, in a spectrum of ways. He did not think about the medium in one way only. He was making photographs as photographs, but he was also making them in part as uh, sources for uh, possible paintings and prints. So the Maitland painting that we saw just a few minutes ago came from a whole series of these very simple kind of snapshots, frankly, where he's exploring the possibilities, the structural possibilities of this um, bridge structure that's, that's being built. And the classic here in terms of the play between photographs and paintings, we have the vintage print on the left from which the Crystal Bridges painting came. And at first glance, but only at first glance, we look at this and, and think, yeah, he, he's painting the information that's in the photograph. But um, that's, that's only the beginning, you know, 10% of the issue here. Because the more you look at it, the more you see it is making all kinds of adjustments, all kinds of spatial adjustments. I mean, something as simple as the, the placement of um, the guy's head to the pallets, or the relationship between this rope and the edge of the planks is completely different. The, the positioning here. So he, he made, I'm sure, a series of photographs of, of this scene, but then when he's sitting down at the easel, he's, he's, he's pushing and pulling those forms to create something purely um, painterly. 
Any thoughts on this? I was just going to add, it's not just, you used the word adjustments. Um, it's not just like he was taking the photograph and going, well, this would be a prettier picture if I just nudged the palette over mm -hmm. a little bit. He's, you know, but, and the color is not strictly local color. Um, we don't know what color that uh, pulley was, but presumably yeah. it wasn't too far from that uh, sort of umber color that it ended up as. But the, uh, that sort of blue-gray uh, beam on the, on the right, mm. we're starting to see him choose colors uh, to, as you said, I think push-pull in interesting ways. And he's starting to not just adjust what he sees in the photograph, but in some ways um, uh, play with and obfuscate uh, the, the pushing and pulling of planes as it recedes into space or comes at you. Um, which he'll go, he'll go further with. Uh, but this is definitely an exciting moment um, yeah. in that departure. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. Uh, he, he loved color, and he really studied color intensely, intensely in his art um, studies. Um, and as, as Neilan would say, and I think all of us would say, he emphatically ch worked in a given medium very deliberately yes. to use that medium for what it could do that another medium could not give him. Yeah. He loved what the black and white photograph gave him, and of course he loved what he could do with uh, color on canvas. So the early photographs that are uh, represented in the show downstairs um, include things like this, and um, it's my memory that, that these are all Buffalo subjects. So he's not just recording some of the same kind of subjects that he remembered from his youth and adolescence, but he's literally going back to the same places and making photographs of uh, the grain elevators, the, the beautiful play of light and shadow and structure across the surface of these. And, you know, other, obviously other folks dealt with industrial subjects in the U.S., but I, I honestly don't know of any other photographer that, that made, you know, exactly this kind of picture. There's a complexity. Um, so many of these photographs to me are about his love of drawing. You know, yeah. he's fascinated by these natural sort of found drawings that, that result from the play of light and shadow. And this, I think, is a fantastic picture. This was rendered as a print. Hmm. Was it a painting? I thought it was a, a painting as well, but it Maybe I mean, this, both. This kind of illustrates whether or not it's the case in this particular case, but it illustrates what you're talking about. You would have, he might do a drawing or a suite of drawings and then a photograph or a photograph mm. and then a suite of drawings and then a print and then a painting and then three more paintings and then back to a couple photographs yeah. on, a, on a particular subject, not always cropped the same way, not always with the same, uh, you know, chromatic intentions, like he's using different colors to animate different planes. But uh, it, it, would, it, would, it would not surprise me if there was a painting that related to this and maybe 10 drawings uh, yeah. or a couple prints or, and that kind of, I, I think one of the things that, that um, I keep remembering is that he's not producing hundreds of canvases. He's not the sort of person who says, okay, we'll just keep turning out paintings until we get it right. Mm -hmm. He sits down with a photograph, he sits down with uh, some printmaking process, and then very carefully deliberates. Um, my perspective is often... Um, one in which the painting is the final version of things. And that's not really the right lens to mm -hmm. look at Crawford through because sometimes the painting is kind of just a step towards something else. And sometimes there's no sense in putting a, an order yeah. you know, to things at all because the photograph is more important or equally important as the painting to, mm -hmm. to, to Ralston is, is yeah. my perspective. Yeah. So these are on the wall downstairs. And again, these were made probably within a minute or two of each other. It's the same subject, but it feels so different because he simply cropped, diff uh, cropped them differently and, and physically moved a bit, you know, maybe moved 40 feet or something. But, but these do represent the exact same subject. Um, the experience of the war and the A-bomb had a huge impact on Crawford and I think contributed to really changing his psyche, 
and his notion about what his art was going to be about. I had mentioned that in his service in the, the war, um, he made, uh, in part, he made these kind of modernist uh, weather charts or maps for the aid of pilots, for them to visualize weather systems. And to me, this is so fascinating because he begins with work that's all about structure, fixed structure. And these weather maps are all about flux and change. They're completely, they, they represent a completely dynamic processes, um, actually fields of force that are interacting in co very complicated ways. So this new, for me at least, this introduces a new notion um, that becomes central to what he's all about, and that is the notion of flux and change and the dynamism of forces. A snapshot he made at one of the uh, aircraft assembly factories that he visited. This is the first page of drawings that we've seen, but um, he drew a lot, and I think the drawings are beautiful. Um, he, he, he treated drawing to some degree parallel to how he treated photography, that is to make multiple interpretations of a given subject. He was all about exploring the possibilities of a given subject. Um, you know, yeah, he, absolutely. I mean, you see it right here. That I, that this is all on one sheet, too, right? So these yeah. aren't just four drawings that you put together. This is, you see his wandering eye from just this, the, the, the lower left here, where it's almost just two planes of tone uh, to something that looks to me a lot like something that Stuart Davis would yeah. do around the same time, yeah. uh, to something that's a little bit more recognizable to something that looks like I, you know, those dots become rivets where over mm -hmm. here they're just dots. But now I'm like imposing this like chronology. I don't know which one he made first, yeah. right? So. Yeah. But yeah, his, his sketchbooks are fabulous. And most, of, from what I've seen, most of the pages have multiple images yeah. on them. And now we see the introduction of this theme of destruction and chaos in his work. So my thesis in the book, and the text I wrote, was that dating from World War II and what he saw and, and you know, experienced in that period, from there on his career combines these three big ideas of pure form, logic, structure, second being flux, dynamism, entropy, change, and the third being um, destruction and chaos. Um, but I see those as part of a sort of a big yin-yang sort of uh, cycle of creation and dissolution. So that, that's my thesis at least. And, and that begins in World War II and the, the traumatic stuff he saw. Crashed airplanes and most traumatic, I think, um, was his, the fact that he witnessed the July 1946 A-bomb test at Bikini Atoll. Um, he was the representative for Fortune magazine. Fortune magazine sent an artist to witness this event. There were photojournalists there, there were reporters there, there were um, uh, military officials and so forth. There were actually hundreds of invited guests, but Crawford was the one and only artist invited to witness um, these tests. And of course, these were the fir first public tests of, of atomic bombs. Um, and they witnessed them from, you know, several miles away, of course. Um, but it was totally overwhelming. You know, to, to see with your own eyeballs the, the power of atomic bombs exploding in front of you um, had, a, had a big impact. And Fortune magazine did an article <clears throat> on this. This is the December 1946 issue of Fortune. The test happened in Ju July. Um, but in the meantime, Crawford made several paintings of these subjects that were reproduced in Fortune magazine's report on this event. I, th I think it's so interesting. Yeah. Of course, Fortune had a relationship with contemporary design and, and contemporary avant-garde art. Mm -hmm. But it's still so fascinating that, that a, a report on this event would use paintings to... I mean, I think it reflects the enormity of this incident where, you know, how, how do you represent the yeah. awesome destructive power of something like this? I think Ralston struggled to wrap his mind around it too. He did. There's something, uh, you know, uh, a canvas seems inadequate and yeah. it changes everything in his work. 
So that was the first spread. This is the second spread. Those are U.S. Navy official photographs on the left, but that's another Crawford painting on the right. And the Crawford painting is of the, the destruction of the um, uh, scrap vessels that were parked in Bikini Atoll and, and blown up. And the, the witnesses, the spectators, were allowed to come into the scene to you know, inspect the damage. I'm not sure how many days after, but um, probably not enough, not enough. days after. <laughs> Um, Crawford died of leukemia um, 30, no, yeah, 30 years later, and, you know, leukemia is leukemia, but um, Neelan has said to me that uh, he didn't know of any other family um, uh, preponderance for that or, or tendency for that, and so, anyway. And the last page of this report is this really chilling uh, map done by Crawford and the title is, um, if, Bikini, if the Bikini Atoll bomb had been dropped on New York City, which is the black area, the, the yellow would be the, the flume of radioactivity and how far it would go. So he's, he's using his artistic skills to render these nightmarish <laughs> situations. And that changed, that changed how we looked at the world. Um, I, I have no doubt about that. So I've got four visuals here of sort of characteristic paintings from the 50s and 60s. And if you could chat a little bit about. Oh, yeah. So this is St. Anne Street. Um, this is like 54 or something like that. And this is not a, not a big picture. Um, but notice how the, the, just the panels of color are are things that feel like you can start to decode what he might have been looking at, but it's refreshing and the, the photographs keep reminding you. He was looking at something. He was looking at something very particular and he might have broken that down again in, in drawings, maybe a print, something like that. I don't think there are any prints that like uh, lithographs or anything like that that relate to this, mm. but, uh, but he's using um, that sort of pale yellow and the, the, the pale blues to sort of push and pull in, uh, um, in particular ways. And there's this sort of like trumpet shape at the bottom, which I've always wondered hmm. about. Well, and St. Anne Street is New Orleans. There you go. So this is one of the nautical subjects. Oh, yeah, this is uh, the fishing the, boats number yeah. two or something like that. So he does a, that's actually interesting because there's a, a series of these uh, numbered paintings. I think there are eight of them in total, but uh, called fishing boats number one through eight. Um, and there, you know, you often see this, this sort of uh, double cone shape, which I guess is a buoy or something mm -hmm. like that. And again, these, you know, rows of parallel lines that, you know, were certainly of some observed texture, but just this uh, large, you know, sort of abstract maroon shape at the left mm -hmm. is, uh, it, it kind of defies your ability to figure it out, but there's definitely something going on there. And, and I think that forcing your eye to engage with something that feels familiar that you want to crawl over but can't quite figure out is definitely, this is, this is, the, new, like, this is the new Crawford. This is not what he was doing in the Cezanne-influenced the right. uh, 30s and early 40s. This is another New Orleans based painting from one of the cemeteries in New Orleans. Oh, I think this is, this is pretty late, too. This is later in his life, um, mm -hmm. this Basin, Basin Street, I think. Um, but it really is true that he, he, he was, I, I don't know, I, he was proud of the fact that he didn't have to invent mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. Everything in his paintings is derived in some way from some real visual experience. And the emphasis on visual, too, because, you know, this is the time period when you have, you know, Jackson Pollock and Helen Frankenthaler and uh, other, other painters who are, um, maybe they're expressing something real, maybe they're expressing something concrete, but it's not a visual real thing. Like, mm. Jackson Pollock is exploding mm. with triumphant lines of angst and whatever. Um, but it wasn't like you could have gone and traced back each line to no. some sort of visual information that you could have seen somewhere. The photographs really emphasize that for me. Like even if you're sort of despairing at figuring out what these puzzle pieces fit together, 
there's kind of this article of faith for, for Ralston's work that he really was looking at something and you will be rewarded by, mm -hmm. for staring deeply at things. So I mean, the, only, the only photographer that comes to mind that does something similar is, is Aaron Siskind who has mm -hmm. photographs that are almost totally abstracted, but he never lifted a paintbrush as far as I know. Right. So. They're different. completely straight. They just yeah. happen to be of um, inherently abstractive kind of yeah. things. And this is, um, I think, a work on paper. Yeah, um, that's another New the, Orleans yeah. thing, I'm guessing. Yes, yeah. That little sort of blue cone up there mm. is, uh, you'll see yeah, sort we'll of see again that later. Again. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then I thought it'd be interesting to just walk through a couple of these um, uh, specific subjects. There's three specific subjects that I thought we'd deal with here. The first is the Third Avenue L in New York, the elevated train. And in 1948-49, Crawford made lots of photographs of it and especially the structural supports. This one's in the show. This is our piece that's in the show. Uh, these are two other variants. Uh, the one on the left shows his cropping indications. The one on the right is a side view of another one of those painted supports. And he translated um, various photographs, or, or maybe didn't even begin with photographs, but he made uh, prints of uh, this motif uh, over a period of at least several years. Yeah. Did he actually make paintings of the Third Avenue? I don't know of any. There may be, there may be, but there, I, I don't know. This, this seems to be a photographic <laughs> and a print idea for him. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, I mean, it's just so iconic that, oh yeah, there's okay, this. That's yeah, a, yeah, yeah, right. Sorry. So, <laughs> so that's a painting for sure. And it's not related specifically to the image on the left, but um, the image on the left, I think, suggests where the bits and pieces are coming from yeah. um, in the painting. And then this is a print. Yeah. I, I was thinking of this when I was talking. And this is uh, sort of looking straight up into the structure of the tracks. He began uh, extensive printmaking in 1951, um, and he worked with a number, three or four of the best uh, print shops in Paris, the classic lithography shops and etching workshops, the, the, the workshops that had done work for Picasso and you know, all, all the big names. So he made regular trips back and forth to Paris uh, beginning in 51. Uh, the second comparison, this is a photograph in the show of um, uh, railroad cars in Minneapolis. And if you look closely at like the ladder here on the left-hand side, um, this is a painting made from, yeah. you know, if not that photograph, parts, bits and pieces of that photograph, I think. But this wonderful, I mean, I love this, this kind of painting where it, it is derived from reality, but it just jazzes everything up. It yeah. like throws the parts into a blender and just, uh, you know, creates something with this wonderful kind of energy and mystery and ambiguity, um, suggestions of space and depth, and yet at the same time it's completely flat and so forth. Also, from a from a composition standpoint, you know things like so. This is this is less haunted. I'm you know I'm you don't want to psychologize too much, but this is a less haunted by the horrors of war sort of yeah. moment. Even though this is uh, late forties, early fifties, or something. Um, but compositionally, he's been he's changed entirely from what he was doing before the war, which was often um, uh, you know like there'd be a horizon line, then there'd be sky above it. Now he always activates the entire plane of the picture. So the mm. ladder goes all the way up. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no horizon line, there's no break. It is sort of an all over compositional structure. And I think that comes from his, his work in photography. I, I mean, mm. because he's, he's cropping in a way that you don't mm. necessarily think to do that Cezanne never thought to do. So mm -hmm. I don't know, I think that the printmaking and photography definitely informed that. Mm. And then the third subject is um, a scene in Cologne. He went to Cologne in 1951. Um, on that same first visit to the print shops in Paris, he wanted to buy a new Leica camera, and so he made a side excursion over to Cologne, Germany, and was shocked that in 1951, six years after the end of the war, huge chunks of Cologne were still a barren, um, blasted um, mess. And this is an aerial, aerial view of Cologne. This is not by him. 
Um, but this is a drawing, for example, that uh, stemmed from that, that visit. Well, it's dated 53. It says Cologne. Yeah, it says 53. Hmm. But this, this is a Cologne subject. Then our photograph is the one on the right. <clears throat> and at first, I knew this horizontal image existed. And before I put the two together, I thought, well, he cropped it. But he didn't. They're two separate exposures. Um, and he ended up making, I'll show in just a sec, uh, prints from especially one on the left. But you can see here, he's just stepped like eight or 10 inches to one side, moved in just a tad to create a different picture between A and B. And uh, he loved the way the camera allowed him to explore permutations. This is a lithograph, it stems from that same motif. And, okay, so that's, any thoughts on those? Well, I, I, I love these, the, the juxtaposition that you've done, just the, I don't really understand what that black form that's hanging it's, down. Is yeah. that a hole or is no, it like... No, it's a shard of concrete oh, okay. with, with the rebar that ran through it um, supporting see. it. But it's, it's like a, a slab of meat or a, yeah. a hanged man or something. It's I a mean, haunting thing. And you see that in the painting as well. But there's very haunting, yeah. something heavy about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, New Orleans was the, the nut that I had to crack to make sense for myself of Crawford's work as a photographer. Um, I'd known of his New Orleans pictures for years, um, and he made lots and lots of these pictures. They seem different. Many of them seem different from the more formal, art, clearly artistic kind of work that, that we've been seeing with the camera. But finally, I realized, as I tried to suggest early on in our presentation here, that. Crawford knew that the camera could do more than one thing, and he yeah. used it for more than one purpose. He begins the New Orleans work with a conscious documentary aesthetic. He, yes, he's an artist, an abstract painter, and so forth, but the beginning of this New Orleans work um, stemmed from documentary intentions and desires. Now, his eye was his eye, and even in a picture like this, you know, we still have this fabulous sort of formal craziness going on. But the impetus for the New Orleans work in the beginning was uh, uh, from the documentary standpoint. It morphed, it grew, it evolved. Um, and I've got a selection here of New Orleans pictures where we can see. But you know, yeah. the, these kind of images are of named musicians. He recorded the names of these musicians, the date, the place the pictures were made. You know, the kid's face here is just so great. Yeah. You know, that, that is one of the great photographic faces ever. Um, and, and the clubs where these pictures are made were all named. So he, he, was, he was trying to make the best pictures he could, and he was working like a professional photojournalist. These are done with a 4x5 speed graphic with big flash bulbs. You know, he's working like Ouija worked, with exactly the same kind of hardware and technology that, you know, the, the tabloid photographer Ouija would have been using um, in, in basically the same era. But I think, too, that New Orleans for him was an antidote to the destruction and chaos and really horrific quality of World War II. He loved New Orleans. He loved this community, the African-American community. He loved jazz. He, was a, he, this, he began this because of his love for jazz. And the musical creation is itself an amazing art form, you know, indigenous to this particular area in this community. So he, he loved this subject for all kinds of positive reasons. Mm -hmm. And he went back repeatedly, multiple times per year, year after year. And as, you, as we'll see, the, the work evolves as well. And these, these, weren't, these weren't published anywhere until, until your beautiful book. Well, he actually did um, send out images to be reproduced in a handful of little jazz publications. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, there are footnotes to that effect. Okay. So some of these were used in that way. And, of course, the Tulane Jazz Archive mm -hmm. made a big purchase from him in 1960 or 61 of 800 photographs. Okay. So he was encouraged by a couple musicologists and music historians in New Orleans, um, they would go out with them and say, you know, this clarinet player is 
really, really important. You need to get a portrait of him. Why don't you photograph him in the club and maybe at home? You know, how, how much of that was Crawford's own idea? I, I think a lot of it was his own idea, but he did get ideas and information from expert musicologists in New Orleans. Um, so the guy on the right, I, f I forget his name, but he's a, he's a name musician. And of course, at this time, that classic Dixieland style was uh, 40, 50 years old, or at least, well, 30 or 40 years old, and many of the great practitioners were dying off. And so Crawford saw this project as, in part, uh, to celebrate this, the community, the artistic creation of this community, but also as kind of a historical reclamation project to record these people and places while they were still there. But then he, he does other work in the city itself, and he just loves so much about New Orleans, the, the folk kind of architecture, signage. And you know, this picture is clearly a formal, artistically conceived work. It's different than the guy playing the trombone. Then he does a lot of work with 35 millimeter. Um, uh, and these pictures are very loose, um, but they're, they're about, again, the kind of ebb and flow and vitality and improvisational spirit of the city sidewalk and street with bands, you know, for funerals and um, processions, you know, coming and going. The, the music literally was, well, was not just in clubs, but it literally was in the street um, on, a, on a very regular basis. I like these, but they're, they're, yeah. they're much looser um, and more improvisational in feeling than um, the work he did with larger format or, or earlier. But, but these are basically all 1950s images. And Jonathan had made reference to the, the shape of uh, one of these. Uh, oh, yeah. So these, these cones are, so uh, the, I guess because of the high water table in New Orleans, there mm -hmm. are above ground mausoleums are uh, in the historic uh, cemeteries. And so there are these, uh, I don't know if they're tin cones uh, that you can put flower arrangements in. And I think that that, uh, that attracted Ralston's eye, both the subject matter of the, you know, going to cemeteries as a place uh, to sort of you know, grapple in a life-affirming way with the concept of mortality. That's my own pet pet view. Maybe Dylan would disagree, but um, uh, but then also just being absorbed by these, you know, this just simple triangle form that is just very seductively weird, and uh, and then that looking at it just with a you know a little bit different uh, different time of day, or maybe it's just a different angle. Of a similar thing, where you see the the, the perforated, uh, almost palm tree like uh, shadow that it casts, and he he really zooms in on this in in paintings, prints, photos, drawings. The Welcome, Neilan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> Neil, well, come on up. Neil. Come on up. Uh, let me let me yield my uh, my earpiece here. Uh, all right. Je Jonathan has done a wonderful job of. Yeah. <laughs> Good work, Jonathan. <laughs> I'm going to ask questions from the camera. Yeah. Uh -oh. Yeah. So we're getting toward the end of this, but there'll be time when we're done for folks to, to meet with you. Thanks, again. Jonathan. Just yep. yep. Well, again, thanks for uh, oh. coming from the far side of the <laughs> earth. And the earth is round, isn't it? It appears to be. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right. So we, okay, well, now we're, we're dealing with a couple of the individual themes. Um, the theme of... Uh, marine studies, ships, boats, water, and so forth. Um, what can I get you to... Of course, Neelan sat side by side with his father while he was painting. Neelan made a movie of his father painting. Neelan accompanied him on trips to the print shops in Paris in the 1950s. How can you summarize all that in three minutes? 
That's what I have, three minutes? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Ask me a question or give me a clue what you've been saying. I've well, seen, we've, we've, seen, we, yeah. we've walked through the, the visuals that I'd sent you. Um, and I, I think, you know, tr tried to talk about various ideas in, in the work. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about that, that I know you're interested in is the idea of what did an artist like him, what did he as an artist do on a daily basis, say in the 1950s? What, what was the working process like? How, how did he spend his time? Well, I mean, I, I, I consider myself to have been so lucky to have grown up under his influence. Um, he, 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 he was a serious, he took himself seriously, and he was serious at his pursuits. And he, would, he had a studio in the first, in the 50s, mm -hmm. when you're mentioning, on, the, on East 20th Street in New York. So my earliest memories are going to that studio uh, on rare occasions. He didn't, he didn't want kids running around the studio most of the time. But on special occasions, I could come and be there for a couple hours while he actually painted or did other things. And... I guess one of my earliest memories is at age five, crossing the Atlantic, so that'd be 1951, hmm. uh, to go, Which, he, he would make trips to, to Europe to make prints and to photograph and to see the bullfights and, mm -hmm. you know, to go visit museums and work that he thought was important. He to, visited museums throughout his whole life. I mean, he, he loved doing that in every new city, I presume. Yeah, and I, I think he, he, he was not really interested in vacations, hmm. but he liked to travel. And so he set himself with a, a goal, a destination, like go to the Prado and mm -hmm. look at fine, important paintings and learn from them. Mm -hmm. And he didn't mind if on the way <clears throat> there were some bullfights and some good meals and a lot of wine and fun things to do. Right. And on... Some occasions he took the family, and other occasions he just went by himself. Yeah. And so at age five, I remember crossing the, the Atlantic on a ship twice, which was, <laughs> in hindsight, a fabulous early, early memory, because mm -hmm. you know, it taught me all about perspective and distance, and you know, there's this big ocean to think about. And, and um, then at age eight, we spent a year, when I was eight, in whatever that'd be, 54, um, we spent a year in Paris. And he, real, Ralston, really focused on lithography. He loved the relationship between the artist and the lithographic printers, who he saw as artists as well. They knew their craft really mm -hmm. well. And it was sort of this historical legacy that was fading at that point. You know, it, mm. I think it was at its real peak in the 20s and 30s, mm. and, and then the war slowed things down. And, you know, this ability where you come into the studio and they give you a good drawing table and a stone of your, you choose the size of the mm. stone, and then you come in and work on the stone till it's ready, and then you have this master printer who you can guide to, you tell him what you want, and he knows how to do it. Hmm. And that was a very potent, and, and so I, my memory is as, as an eight-year-old sitting at the next drafting hmm. table with my little stone, <laughs> you know, making fairly juvenile art, you know, uh, maybe it's not even art, but just juvenile efforts. And um, it, was, it was a precious, yeah. wonderful memory to yeah. Okay, wise guy, you know, here's a blank stone. <laughs> do something. Put the lines on it and do, do you know, figure yeah. out what you want to do. Yeah. And that's something you and I have talked about, that whole mm -hmm. confrontation of the blank, you know, of um, there you go, you know, there's the blank canvas or the frame in the, in the viewfinder. Or it could be transposed over to the writer with a blank sheet of paper. 
and nowadays the, mm -hmm. the screen. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, what do you want to do? And that whole question of motivation, you know, are, yeah. are, you, are you doing it because someone else needs an advertisement for a product? Are you doing it to curry favor with some political direction? Yeah. Or what? The, of course, with paintings, he did everything. He, did, he made every line. He made every stroke. It's interesting, with printmaking, he collaborated with the highly skilled technicians and with the photographs. He had the darkroom in his own um, studio, but he had an assistant or two that would make prints under his direction. So with printmaking and with photography, he felt free to work with skilled collaborators or artisans, um, as opposed to painting, of course, which is a completely solo sort of idea. Right, and I think that the, I think the influence of the printmaking probably helped or supported the idea of bringing in an assistant ah, to the darkroom. Okay, but I also think that um, he wanted. He considered himself a painter, so the primary effort was the painting, and uh, he he liked the photography and took it seriously on his own right. But it wasn't until he had a large commission from the uh, New Orleans, yeah, Tulane, uh, Tulane yeah. Uh, jazz archives, that he hired somebody and said, "I I don't want to mm. make five hundred prints for mm -hmm. this commission. I don't think it was that lucrative a situation, but it was lucrative enough to mm -hmm. justify yeah. you know, bringing in somebody. Yeah. So, and I think he also made, a, in both cases, some kind of emotional separation between original work and duplication or, or mm -hmm. publication. Or editioning. Or, or yeah. Editioning, yeah. yeah. Um, a passage here of images done on his various travels, as Jonathan and I had talked about. He had a, a great love for travel, and it was something that he was devoted to really from the time he was young. Um, images like this I'd never seen before, but I think are really fabulous. And of course, the Holy Week in Seville fascinated him. Um, can you talk to, for just a minute about the, the appeal of this subject and how, how often he went back? The Seville? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think it came, I mean, there's, there's, now it's very difficult for me, having read all the essays by various people over the years, having talked with him, having just observed him, and then I've had another 40 years since he died to think about it, and I'm sure I'm adding some of my perspective into it as well, but I think that the bullfight Spanish food, wine combination, the mm. music of the bullfights and so on, was a very powerful thing for mm. lots of his predecessors as well. Mm -hmm. right? It was in you know, Picasso and Hemingway and various other people that had focused on it. And, mm -hmm. and, and also it's a very powerful event you know, to, to witness. And so that was something he started really gravitating towards during the 50s. And then I think that the running of the bulls and so on and the whole spiritual relationship between the matador and the bull and, you know, what is, you know, what's the going on? The life-death thing. Yeah, what's yeah. going on here? Mm -hmm. And then there's the Holy Week in Seville. He, he wasn't a devout, you know, serious Christian or Protestant or Presby I think his general flavor was Presbyterian uh, as he grew up. But he really liked the sentiments and the power and some of the expressions of it. So I think the Holy Week piece really started, I'm not, I don't know the date of his first trip there. I don't know if, you, if that's something you know. But uh, I think it would, in the mid, by I'm the mid 60s. Sure. Yeah, you know, okay. He was, you know, either making a separate trip to Holy Week mm -hmm. or appending that to some other uh, 
yeah. either France or Spain. We have a we have the bullfight picture here that's that's on view downstairs. Yeah. Um, and then we get into subjects like signage. Um, this is a Spanish picture, but it relates to um, the, some of the things he did in New York City. Um, one of the things I think would surprise people is the idea that he had a sense of humor and there's a certain kind of, there's a certain element of wit in some of the pictures at least, um, a certain sardonic um, observation on contemporary life, contemporary society. These, um, these are from 1966, I think, Buckley. And then I've got th these three images in a row um, that deal with the, the tabloid press, you know, with titles like, or headlines like, nine-year-old girl barred from school because she's too ugly, beetle father's illegitimate baby, how I tame Liz, half dog, half girl, and, and so forth, you know, showing the, the, the glory of, um, well, maybe this is fake news, I, I'm not sure, but... <laughs> Um, but this, this theme of pop culture is there, and um, the, the, the facet of his work that deals with street photography, so I've got the three images on the wall downstairs, that one of the newsstand, this one of um, a wandering guy who's apparently pulled a newspaper out of a rubbish bin, um, and just this idea that the news is new until it's not anymore, and that cycle happens really quickly followed by this picture um, of the New York Times being thrown away, and the, the photograph is detailed enough that you can see that the headline is about the capture of James Earl Ray in London, the assumed assassin of Martin Luther King Jr. So we know the exact date of this paper, it's June 6th or whatever, 1968, I think. Right. Um, but this, I think, th this is, unusual in his work to have this kind of specific cultural or, or historical reference, it seems to me at least. Yeah, and, and I think both the humor and the poignancy mm -hmm. of these various examples is important, you know, and, and not fortuitous, right? He's, right. He, no, they're very the, deliberate. The open yeah. question is whether he put the newspaper in there or not. Ah! Right? <laughs> <laughs> would, right. He, would he have done such well, a thing? Well, that's an argument, and I'm not sure who, with who, he, I don't know what the resolution is. The <laughs> argument was with the torn sign billboard things, right. whether it was ethical or not to tear it just a little more to, to, help improve, the, to, yeah. to improve the composition huh? or not, you know, and... Of course, that's what I, artists do. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure where he... I don't think he tended to do a lot of adjustments and tearing and mm -hmm. building up the shadows to make them just... But I, I don't know if he would resist not just adding one. Yeah. Or yeah. that's, you know, what, if he, maybe the paper was there, but he shifted around so it was laying mm -hmm. flat. Mm -hmm. Or that I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's, it's all fair game to... But it's no accident... Right. And this is not just a picture of junk in a in a right a rubbish bin, yeah. And then uh, so we finish then with this this theme of creation, destruction, um, as part of this grand cycle, in my interpretation at least, of of uh, renewal, of creation, destruction, renewal again. Uh, but he made lots of um, photographs, certainly of detritus, or this is a broken window taped up, um, shards of concrete with rebar from some building that's been knocked down in New York, I presume, uh, this great um, railroad recycling yard in Duluth, I mm -hmm. think it is, where, you know, locomotives are being hacked apart to, to recycle the steel. This is the cover image of our book, and I love it because it's all about this precision and order, and yet this also is in the recycling yard. So this too has passed its use-by date. But, but also, when I, when I first got the book, I looked at that and I thought, oh, Sheeler, Weston, you know. And then I thought it was just a really 
interesting sequel because it's not the pristine, perfect mm -hmm. locomotive driver, but it's this shambled collage junkyard mm -hmm. version of it. So it's it's a co combination of you know 50 years have passed. Yeah, uh, steam engines are no longer in their heyday, and it's a different solution. It's a it's mm -hmm. so I thought. Uh, so I really enjoyed seeing that in that prominence by putting it on the Good. cover of the book. You know, it was a very interesting double take that I did with it. Yeah. yeah. And then this is the last slide I have, and it's also the last image in the show. And I, I like it because these are pristine forms, but they're not functional yet. So th this to me is about the potential for creating perfect functional forms. Um, it's not um, damaged and... and recycled sort of forms, but the process by which order is imposed from the human mind onto the physical world. Um, but to me, this, this kind of theme is so important, especially in his last 10 years. And maybe part of it is that he was conscious of his mortality because he'd been diagnosed with leukemia five or six, seven years before he died. Yeah, in 71... He was told he had two weeks to live. No. He collapsed in a hospital in London. And he got whisked off to this sort of classic World War II British open ward. And uh, we all flew over to see what was going on. And they said, he's, he's done. No. Two, we two weeks. And we actually, an interesting little tidbit was we actually went to check out this newfound idea called hospice with a woman named Cecily Saunders, who is the founder of the original hospice in England, and that what then grew into this huge worldwide movement. And uh, he sort of said, I am not ready. <laughs> I got things I got to do. <laughs> and he pulled himself up by his bootstraps and came home. You know, and, and was and, working uh, for years. Worked for another seven years. Yeah. And... Um, that, that was, you know. What, I mean, to, to sum up, what message do you think he would have wanted to convey to today's artists, today's students, today's art enthusiasts about the process, about how to look, about how to, I mean, what, is there a sort of a key message that, that you think really... Um, would convey something fundamental about his outlook? I don't think he would, he taught a lot. He did. Off and on through his whole career from the 40s on. He interspersed teaching with these travels, with working in the New York environment in the studio. And that was partly for to raise income. And also he had one line which he said, which was, when he was teaching, he could do his best painting, <laughs> and when he was painting, he he could do his best teaching, but he couldn't do both at the same time. <laughs> right? So, and I don't think he would ever tell anybody, "You ought to do this." He would say something more like, "That's your job is to figure out mm. what you want to do." When I said to him at some ridiculous age of ten or eleven or something, Dad. Should I be an artist? And I think without batting an eye, my memory was he said something like, well, if you can think of anything you'd rather do, do that. <laughs> Which is this sort of backhanded way of saying, that's your problem, and it's a great way to go if you can't come up with something better. You know? <laughs> and, and, and we so, can all agree on that. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so... And you and I have spoken about this, you know, what does an artist do all day thing. And, of course, it's a, a topic I'm really interested in. And he, Ralston thought the most important thing was for him to try to make a good picture. And he, it, it had, he, had to, he said he didn't think he could find anything for anybody else unless he'd found something for himself. 
though he also kept his distance from a lot of the other artists. He didn't want to be part mm -hmm. of some kind of movement. Mm -hmm. he, you know, he had several good friends. Stuart Davis is probably the most obvious. Mm -hmm. um, Guglielmi, Niall Spencer, yeah. you know, rented his studio one winter when he was in Paris or in France, uh, when Ralston was in France. Um, so I don't think he would ever say, you really ought to do this or that. But he would also underscore that the difference between an artist and a, a fine artist and a commercial artist is the motivation. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of work to make a really beautiful photograph or a really beautiful painting of a whiskey bottle. <laughs> it's not hard, it's not easy. It's hard to do. But the reason for doing it is to make uh, a living and maybe help people drink more. <laughs> and if, if you want to do something that's visually interesting to you and whatever, you're going to have to start with your own criteria for yeah. that. So that, I think probably the strongest message would be something about you're going to have to make your own judgments there. Don't follow the, the latest Vogue. Don't do what the dealer says. Don't do and what, it, what was done last decade. And if anything characterizes his whole career, it's the spirit of independence, the spirit of following his own muse. And there's also that he, he talked, you know, he didn't sit in the studio and think, okay, now I'm an artist and I'm going to make great art. He made pictures of things that he saw. Mm -hmm. He went out. Now, that's also a great excuse to go to Paris and eat good food. Mm -hmm. But, or... Or the r railroad recycling lot in Duluth. <laughs> or Stuart Davis was teaching in Baton Rouge and yeah. he got tired of it, so he talked Ralston into coming down. And Ralston had been to New Orleans before the war mm -hmm. in some of his seafaring days. Mm -hmm. So he jumped at the opportunity. And then, so now he has a job after the war to teach. And he's in proximity to the, muse the music and the food and the musicians of New Orleans. Yeah. And so he became very close to some of the musicians as fellow artists, the black musicians in the clubs, uh, in a way that he didn't with other artists, yeah. other p contemporary painters. Yeah. And um, I, I think that's an, I think that sort of, di he had a lot of respect for his peers and predecessors. You know, the whole emanation from the, that this fountain that came from Cezanne. And, mm -hmm. you know, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts and the Barnes Foundation and all those uh, feeders. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that he also didn't want to be excessively influenced mm -hmm. by any particular direction. Yeah. And rebelled against it. Yeah. You know, and, and then there's this other thing that we've talked about, which is this, this thing of him building up major bodies of, he, he considered himself primarily a painter, but he made over a hundred editions of lithographs and etchings, mm -hmm. and they were not casual. They were very resolved, finished efforts. And then there's this, depending on how you count, either 50 or 40 years of photography, you know, depending yeah, on right. where you put the very beginning. And then there's the whole body of 16 millimeter films. Yeah, 50,000 feet. You know, which he, so, some of the earliest films were in the late 40s. Mm -hmm. right, of, he shot some pretty interesting footage of close-ups of a, in 16 millimeter of a praying mantis. Hmm. You know, like details of its head mm -hmm. and legs and so on. Hmm. Which, and it's, it's, it's never become a finished yep. anything. Yeah. It, it's pretty interesting. And so to have these five or six major bodies of work, each with different strengths but resolved. Mm -hmm. And each one really deep, yeah. yeah. Well, I, we've gone past our official time here, but I, I, I'm so pleased that Neilan was able to make it here. And there'll be a few minutes of, of uh, chat that we can, we can do out here, I think, or, well, very few. <laughs>
Um, but I, I want to I want to thank Jonathan for stepping up on uh, extremely short notice, and I want to thank Neilan for for making it out here.